Don't see eye to eye, no, we don't see eye to eye, yeah. Don't see eye to eye, yeah. I play ball like a prospect, they still look at me like a suspect. Look at me, they see conflict. Look at me, they think combat. Got a contract off a compact, got a contract off my concepts. Look at me with such contempt, swing like they need contacts. See me. They see the wrong path, stare down, they're scared now Officer, they wanna call now, in the park now, in the dark now They watch the way I walk now, don't really wanna talk now Wanna see me on lockdown, yeah Thank God I made it home today If I walked another block, might have gotten blown away I don't think I'd be surprised, these things happen every day Nowadays I for an eye, I don't know just what to say Yeah, Don't see eye to eye, no we don't see eye to eye don't see eye to eye, no we don't see eye to eye, yeah. Don't see eye to eye, no we don't see eye to eye, yeah. Don't see eye to eye, yeah. RPSM talks. 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 I would like to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually, the land on which many of us are gathered tonight has been the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be making music together here virtually with all of you this evening. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our PSM Talks brought to you by Regent Park School of Music. Regent Park School of Music is a community music school providing music lessons to both the Regent Park and Jane and Finch communities for over 20 years by removing financial obstacles. To learn more about the school, please visit www.rpmusic.org. Uh, I'm Thompson. Uh, I'm your host for today, and uh, it is a pleasure to be here uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time. I'm somebody who's been involved with the school from uh, the day one. I've been involved as a teacher, uh, as a student teacher, day camp host, um, and now your uh, talks host. Uh, shout out to those in the audience who took advantage of the RPSM meal deal. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with this, RPSM has partnered with two local businesses, Regent Park Catering Collective in Regent Park and Devon Good Food Kitchen in Jane Finch. If you, uh, you can order in advance and enjoy uh, as an audience member and remember to quote RPSM uh, as we're holding this virtual event like this and for other recitals. Visit the social media channel for more information. So if you're currently enjoying some good food uh, and enjoying the discount deal, you know you're supporting local businesses. A little bit of housekeeping rules. Um, keep yourself on mute unless uh, invited to unmute. If you have a question, please uh, put it in the chat. And also our panelists, please feel free to look at the chat and answer any questions you see there, but there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, please respect our shared virtual school space uh, and keep the content discussed here, um, classroom chat friendly. Uh, as well, uh, the best way to view the session is by putting yourself on speaker view in the top right corner, uh, which is great. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, today's talk is self-promotion, um, which I'm really excited about this chat just because I think, you know, with, if you've been following with the other chats that we've done up until this point, uh, this chat could also be, I feel like it could also be titled, where do I begin? And, uh, we've got an impressive lineup in just a group of panelists who've done, I think some creative stuff and, 
the base, best, one of the best ways, I think, um, you know, when you look at what they've done, it's sort of just like, hey, let's just bring everything who I am and then like, and then offer that to the world. So I'm excited to uh, share that with you guys. Uh, I will introduce our panelists. I'm starting off with uh, Josephine Cruz, AKA JMKM, uh, who is a multidisciplinary uh, and creative entrepreneur based out of Toronto. Um, she's also from Calgary. She has been basically making her name in the city as a DJ, event producer, curator, um, also a community leader um, and organizer. Her resume really includes um, Hyperbeast, Complex, Serato, uh, Red Bull, and more. Uh, brands that she's also dj for include Nike, Jordan, Adidas, Puma, Sephora, Lululemon, Google, Spotify, Vice, the list, list goes on and on and on. Um, as well, you know, she has a passion for sharing her knowledge uh, in workshops just like this. Uh, she's worked with various groups, uh, marketing um, and business with the Remix Project, which is a um, organization that some of us are familiar with. Uh, and in addition to that, as if that wasn't enough, um, she runs uh, her own record label called Bear Selection um, with her partner, Frieza Chin, um, and is a co-founder of a community radio station um, that's home to over 40 reoccurring shows that uh, exist to kind of platform underground music and forward thinking discussions uh, for underrepresented um, people in the community and uh, uh, for topics that aren't uh, part of mainstream media. Uh, next, we have actually a label mate of mine. Um, I don't know if he knows it. We're both uh, with E1. Um, and lucky for us, uh, tomorrow he's dropping a new album called Parallel World. And so make sure, uh, as they would say, you go cop that. So whatever, Spotify, Amazon, Apple Play. Uh, I don't know if you're on, um, what's the other one? Bandcamp. Is yeah, I'm on, I'm on Friday? Bandcamp for is sure. It, is there a Bandcamp Friday tomorrow? Uh, next week. Uh, okay. I mean, so listen on Spotify tomorrow and then cop it on Bandcamp next week, Friday. You know, um, so, but anyways, yeah, Cadence Weapon, thanks for joining us. Um, I've just mentioned that uh, we got the new album dropping tomorrow. Um, his previous albums, Breaking K Fabe and Hope in the Dirt City. We're both shortlisted uh, nominees for the Polar Surprise. And um, he's also, the he was a poet, the, the poet laureate, sorry, um, of Edmonton uh, from 2009 to 2011, uh, making him the literary ambassador for his hometown. Um, his poem, The Garden, was incorporated in the bronze sculpture at the Alberta um, Legislative Grounds in Edmonton in 2018. So a lot of great stuff going on there. He's also narrated and um, writer for a Viceland TV series called Payday um, and Mr. Tycon. And uh, I hope I did I say that right? It's a tachyon, but tachyon. it's like yeah. I mean, it's not like a word or anything. Uh, so it's, it's all it good. All right. Well, I feel a little better, but not really. So, but that's fine. Um, and uh, he's well as well. Yeah, uh, he's been on Q Radio and uh, Red Bull Music Academy and done a bunch of other stuff. He has a book coming out, which uh, actually I'm excited to. Are you going to do it on audiobook? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Because I love audio books. I've forgotten how to read um, and don't have much time. So it's kind of <laughs> like I just had a baby and it's like, and now I'm, my audio books are accompanying me on my little stroll and walk. So that's great. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got uh, Melissa Vincent. Um, and again, just excited to have her here. She's a Toronto based writer editor, content strategist, um, and her work uh, investigates really just an intersection of equity, intimacy, and community formation as it relates to music, art, technology, and culture. Um, she's been featured in Pitchfork, Billboard, NPR Music, The Fader, CBC Music, El Canada, Vice, Canadian Business, um, and The Globe and Mail. Uh, she has led editorial platforms by Blue Ant Media and Universal Music and has developed campaigns for New Balance in Disney. We all love Disney. It's like Disney, like what doesn't Disney do? Um, and she is recently, uh, sorry, she was recently a digital producer for, um, for where are my notes? Sorry, I apologize for the media strategist for uh, Pigeon Row, um, handling the Banger Film Portfolio, which is really cool. If you haven't checked that out, um, do. It's easy enough. Lucas is on the like the Googles 
Um, and he can post that stuff up in the chat, so which is great. Um, she is a Prism Prize juror and a SoCan Songwriting uh, Prize finalist, uh, sorry, panelist, and uh, a member of the Between the Lines Editorial Committee. Um, 2019, she was selected to be a polarized, uh, polar, Polaris Prize juror. There's a lot of words in there, you know. Um, but uh, fortunately, I can let you guys all feel nervous for me, and I'm, I'm not going to do that. Just like, you know, everybody's just like, I'm glad I don't have to do that. You know, you should be. Uh, anyways, we're going to get to it now that the introductions are done. Um, again, like I was saying uh, earlier, I'm really excited about this talk. Um, I think for especially for people who have been following us along this journey of the different conversations we've been having. Um, one of the things I've been really excited to get to is like, where do I start? Uh, and I think that um, the panelists here have been doing um, just when it comes to sort of self promotion, it's kind of really just that starting engine. Like, how do you get your stuff started? There's the people who come along the way to help you out, but also there's um, all the things that you can do on your own before that team comes into play. Uh, and so I hope to uh, explore that and really get into that. And uh, to start, I'm really, I'm just gonna open up the floor um, and maybe just have each panelist start off with kind of what they do, um, maybe a little bit about the journey, but we'll kind of uh, move it along because there's gonna be so much for us to talk to talk about. Uh, and uh, let's all start with you. Oh, hello, hi, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, I am really, really, really excited to be sharing this space with Josephine, uh, Cadence and Thompson. I mean, you all make work that I really admire. Uh, admire in specificity. I think there are individual things that you all really excel at. And I think when we have these conversations about what self-promotion looks like or what it means to really think about your art in a way where you're amplifying the best parts, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to be good at every single thing. But I think that you can focus on what really interests you and you can focus on what really inspires you and devote, it, uh, and devote a lot of time and energy and interest into becoming really good at that. Um, so I guess to talk a little bit about my journey, I think I just was always really a pretty obsessive fan of music. And, um, you know, I think early on, we're not really taught how to make our love for music into something that can also work as a career. And typically, I think sometimes there's a pretty narrow definition where it's like, you're either an artist or you work at a label or you maybe work in music media, but there are a lot of things that support musicians and that support the music industry that uh, are kind of like the gears that keep everything running, whether it's, you know, if you have a writing background, there's a lot of writing opportunities, whether it's press releases or artist bios or all of the other texts that support artist work. And I think as I've sort of developed my career, I've found that it's really helpful to think about how your skills can be transferable in a number of different ways. So long story short, started writing in high school. And then once I got to university, just wrote for a bunch of campus publications that would kind of have me. And I think at that point, it was really important for me to figure out what my voice was and figure out what types of things I wanted to write about and what I wanted to sort of stand for um, as a journalist and what music I wanted to champion. And after exiting there, worked a little bit on the music editorial side for a couple of different publications. And now I'm kind of utilizing all of those skills in a content media strategy sort of realm, supporting um, supporting some social strategy on the banger film side, which put out Hip Hop Evolution, which is a really uh, fantastic archive of hip hop history. And, um, and then work with a lot of other brands and a lot of other partners on the sort of strategy side, whether it comes to thinking about artist campaigns or, uh, anything on this sort of like music editorial um, launching side of things. And yeah, I think that's kind of all of it. I mean, Thompson, do you have any more uh, things you'd like me to clarify or? No, you know what? I think we'll, we'll get to it. We'll do, we'll kind of go around um, and uh, kind of have everyone do the same and then really start to okay. dive into, you know, what that means. Um, so Cadence, I'll, I'll, I'll go over to you and just kind of, um, I think one of the cool things, you know, about this panel is just the sort of migration, if you will, to Toronto um, and sort of the, with the topic of self-promotion and how when you got to move to somewhere else, 
now what are those steps to making you know um, highlighting what it is that you're making yourself visible yeah you know uh, i'm originally from edmonton and you know the biggest difference between there and here is you know this is where the canadian music industry is based you know and and that has just been just such a massive advantage to being here but i remember when i first started out you know uh a lot of it was just on the internet you know it was like i didn't know anybody else who rapped initially you know and so i was just like making my own downloading programs and making my own beats and just like making mixtapes and burning cdrs and spray painting the labels and just doing everything really diy and then sending mp3s to different blogs and stuff and I, I was just really uh obsessive about it because you know before i was making music i was just like a huge rap fan like i listened to every record everything that came out my dad was a rap dj like it was just always around but then i went from you know doing this kind of diy stuff locally to making all these really big connections with you know i used to write for pitchfork like in 2003 when I was like a teenager you know just like in college and at the same time I was meeting all these people from blogs going to South by Southwest and like making those connections all from Edmonton you know and it was like there wasn't really a blueprint at the time to for that kind of thing as an artist you know like there I, I didn't really know everyone I knew in real life who was in a band was just like we're gonna get the vinyl pressed we're gonna get in the van you know, and we're gonna we're gonna do this kind of traditional rock tour. But you know, my whole thing was like using the internet in any way that I could. And I still use that approach today. Does does that like kind of explain? Yeah, so that's, that's that's awesome. And I think we'll we'll dive into that because there is uh I think there's a there's a couple of artists um uh that we can kind of point to that have had sort of this um I wouldn't say trajectory, but have done these little things where that's where they kind of got noticed. So we see them on this grand scale, but there was initially like a parent was putting them on the YouTube or something, or they were just putting their stuff there. I have some friends who um, I remember once chatting with a drummer friend of mine and uh, she was playing at Kerner Hall with a couple of these international artists. And I'm like, man, how did you get hooked up with them? She's like, oh, I just used to put videos up on YouTube. And I was like, you mean people look at that stuff? It's like, yeah. Um, just fade. we're going to go over to you before we start to unpack some of this and, and dive into it. Yes. Um, I love what both of you just said. I really resonated a lot. Um, I am also from Alberta, so me and Kanan's weapon have that in common. Um, I'm from Calgary originally. And um, yeah, I was always kind of like a music fan as well, just like Melissa said. Um, but sort of, you know, pre-social media, um, like there wasn't really, I wasn't sure how people worked in the music industry. I didn't really know what that meant, you know? Like I was like, okay, you can be an artist or you can be in a band or, you know, I think I had heard of like a record label and I was like, you can work at one of those. But I didn't really know what it meant when I was growing up. Um, and then when I kind of discovered the internet and specifically social media and started, you know, learning about all these different people who had all these different jobs in the music industry, um, I was like, oh, wow, there's really a lot out there, you know, and I still think that's one of the coolest things today for me about social media is like, it's really dope to follow like celebrities and artists and stuff like that. But some of my favorite people that I follow online are, are people who just have interesting jobs or have made interesting careers for themselves in the back end or, or in sort of an interesting roundabout way. So um, yeah, that really inspired me to just sort of explore that for myself. And um, yeah, I'd always been into writing. I used to write a little bit more of like kind of creative writing, like poetry and short stories. Um, but again, thanks to the magic of the internet, there was this thing called blogging. And um, it was just, you know, could be whatever you wanted it to be. You could basically have your own little magazine online um, and share the stuff that you thought was cool. So that's kind of how I got into it and, and took that really far, you know, um, where I was like writing for some of the, the biggest sort of online publications at one time. Um, and yeah, again, I was doing that all from Calgary as well. I actually didn't move out to Toronto until I felt like I sort of had enough stuff going on that warranted the move out here where I could actually come out and sort of like make a go for it in the music business. Um, and it's definitely turned into something that I didn't expect, but I think that you, to work in, in this business is very dynamic and you kind of have to like roll with the punches and, and be adaptable and be willing to sort of do things you never thought you would. It's awesome. 
So I have a question about that. And because there's so much going on is when you're starting off, how do you decide what to share? Like, what is like, what is the, like one, how do you decide what to share? But what is that moment where you're like, you know what, what I'm creating, I, I kind of want to, I, I don't want it to just be what I'm doing in my bedroom. I don't want it to just live here. I'd like for the world to enjoy this. Um, you know, Josephine, I'll start, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, a lot of artists, especially who are looking to sort of promote themselves, I think they kind of get caught up with this idea, like, how do I start this? Like, what, what do I do? What do I post even? Like, how do I make an Instagram post? Um, but the way that I've always looked at it, even from, from back then when I first kind of discovered this all the way till now is it's really just sharing the things that you enjoy, you know? And if you, if you find it a bit like overwhelming or, oh my gosh, there's so many things that I enjoy, then the really the easiest way to do it is to just sort of like pick three or four main things. And this is what I do for myself because I'm very, as you can tell by like that bio that you read, like I have so many interests and sometimes it does get a bit like overwhelming. Like, you know, I'm really into this like bottle of water I'm drinking, but does it need to be an Instagram post? I don't know. Um, maybe I've decided that it is, but I kind of, you know, to give you an example of how I do it, like I think of myself and I have sort of these interests, like I have music, I have, I love like fashion and style. I love travel and anything that I'm going to kind of share out there in the world about myself, I kind of want to make sure it fits in one of those sort of buckets, you know, and this is, can be something as granular as a single Instagram post. Or it can be something like this, you know, like if I get asked to, to be part of something like this, I can kind of mentally check with myself, like, does it fit in one of those places? Okay, yeah, it fits in the, in the music bucket, you know? If I got asked to speak on something about, I don't know, cooking, like I might not necessarily do that because it doesn't necessarily fit, even though I like it. Um, but that's just what I've decided for myself to make sure that I'm not like doing absolutely everything. So um, yeah, that's kind of my, my simple way of explaining it. It's just, yeah, you're, you're sharing the things that you like. And that's kind of how you're telling your story out there in the world. Awesome, awesome. Um, and Melissa, so you've been, you were talking about earlier, you, you know, you read, wrote at school and, and sort of that's kind of been a part of your journey. So it's been a part of your journey for a very long time, but what gets you to first say, I'm gonna be a part of this community. So I'm gonna take my writing and now this is going to be where I want to kind of publish it in whatever the platform is and then grow from there. What, what kind of makes, what gets you to that decision? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Josephine raised a really important point about just, just checking in with yourself and what your interests are and kind of where you want to be aligned. And I think when it came to music writing, um, I read so much fantastic writing about music, about musicians that I loved, about uh, music scenes that I loved about places that held shows that I wished I could go to before I kind of considered how I would connect with them um, as a writer or as a place that I would pitch to. And I think a lot of that was just involved in, in, in being a, a bit of a student about the things that I liked and really doing some research on particular um, types of stories that I thought certain websites were telling really well and I think trying to understand in myself, and I think with anybody that's making art or anybody that's interested in the industry, which is like the industry wants you, they want people who are young and thoughtful and fresh and exciting. And like, you don't really need to bend what it is that you do or how it is that you feel to fit into that. You kind of need to look at what you're good at, look at what you enjoy and find a place that best represents and best, um, can platform what it is that you want to do and what it is that you want to say. So, you know, I think, you know, the simplest part of it was just doing, um, you know, building a, a bit of a writing community around me. So that first day that I thought of meeting with an editor, I was like, okay, I have my publication that I want to pitch to. I have my story. Now I have to sort of write this pitch email that I'm going to send off. And I think having, having developed a community of writers around me, um, having people that I could share things with to get a second set of eyes and being able to be a bit of a gut check if I was a bit unsure was really helpful for me to um, not feel like 
I was going out on an island or not feeling like I only had to trust myself, but I felt like I could trust a number of other people around me um, and that my words and my voice could be more powerful in that way. So yeah, I would kind of say that the first step is like just looking around and figuring out um, from the music editorial slash culture side, what it is that really drives you, what it is that you find really interesting from a visual and an editorial point of view. And then, um, and then I think even in a city like Toronto, like people are really open and people are really willing to build community. I think if you come at it from an honest and uh, thoughtful place and, you know, I know a number of people who get really excited when somebody asks some questions about things, especially if they're uncertain. So I think building a little bit of that, and then when you're ready, um, you know, it's typically pretty easy to access editors on, on, on Twitter or just sort of looking at those websites and finding a masthead list if you want to send someone an email. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think now is more than ever, well, always is the time to ask questions, but with things changing so fast, um, whether it's platforms or or new sort of gadgets or apps, you know, to, to share, I think asking the questions of where people are and, and um, how to get it out, I think is really, is really important uh, for everyone to remember. It's just that like, we don't know everything. I, I'm gonna take a quick second just to acknowledge uh, Josephine is a sneakerhead and uh, all the other shoes are behind, but no, it's, uh, it's awesome. I thought I saw that. Um, so Cadence, I have a, so my question for you then, you know, piggy, piggybacking off of what's just kind of happened, which is, because now you, um, well, all of you op occupy different areas, um, but as an artist, as a writer, when you're thinking about what you're gonna share, do you see yourself differently as an artist um, versus a writer versus a content creator? Um, what is, how do you make that decision as to what gets put out? Does it all get put out under sort of one persona or do you have other places for your personas to, um, to, be, to exist? Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's pretty, I try and think of for everything, like, what do I wish that my ultimate artist did? You know, that's the thing I always think of. And that's like my, my compass for myself. It's just like, you know, you know, I look at artists like uh, Frank Ocean, for example, and I see some of the things that he does, you know, like, whether it's like voting initiatives, or just like really creative ways of engaging with people. And I'm like, okay, like what can I do like that or you know like for instance um I've been writing this newsletter right and it's just like I always was like I would love this if one of my favorite artists did something like this you know if they wrote all these like in-depth you know essays about the music they were making and really talked about the influences and really it just comes out of just um the necessity of like what would I like you know and that's like I think what my entire career is about really is like you know, when I started rapping initially, it was just like, I wanted to fill a void that I, that I, I saw there was no rap like what I make, right? So I was thinking like, okay, why don't people rap over stuff like this? You know, why don't people rap over like these electronic beats or combine these genres or whatever? And I was just like, okay, let me, let me be the change I want to see, you know? But like when it comes to like deciding between the different things, it's really, uh, I think it's, I think everything I do feeds into each other. And I think I fi finally, it took me several years, but I finally figured out how to like make the writing speak to the music, uh, speak to the DJing, speak to the production and and speak to the ad advocacy and activism and really make them like kind of like emphasize each other. And it's like, it, it I don't know, it, it, it took a long time for me to like really understand that I could do them all you know, because for a while I was just like, oh, I need to just focus on music and I'm only going to be an artist and I'm, who just puts out records, right? But then it's just like, why am I putting out these records? You know, it's like, I just want to give people as much information as possible. And I'm realizing the more I get to know my fan base and get closer with them is like, you know, some people subscribe to my newsletter and, and some people like watch me DJ on Twitch and some people really like my tweets, but like some people really only interact with me on my Instagram story, right? And it's like, you know, learning how people engage with me really helps me in how I can like tie it all together, you know? So it's, it's funny you say that because I was going to ask a question around sort of strategy and do you, should you have a strategy? It almost sounds like you had a strategy and then you kind of threw the strategy out the window or was it more that the focus was um, 
the I guess the the, re, the the intention behind it changed, and so that ultimately changed what it is you decided to uh, to put out. Yeah, and I think the the music is uh, always the focus, right? That's the, always the core piece for me. You know, that's and that's the thing I I enjoy the most or whatever. But it's like I think it, it was really just an intuitive thing too. Like I didn't really like overthink it. But once I noticed I was doing it just a little bit, I really went super hard with like, you know, I would realize people would like comment to me about something I wrote and then they'd be like, oh, you have a new song out. And I was just like, okay, wait a minute. Why don't I actually do this like in a more meaningful way that is really drawing people to my art from other places, you know? And it's like, I was like, okay, it's, you know, it, it's not like, um, it's weird to think of it like, okay, I'm going to consciously try and attract people or market in a certain way. But now I've realized like, it's not a bad word to think about marketing yourself. You know, that's the thing that that's the biggest thing that is like helped my career the most is realizing that marketing itself is an art form, you know, and they're the, the people who are like not popping, <laughs> not, not to be like mean or something to so like artists or whatever, but it's like, some people will be like, oh man, nobody wants to like check out my stuff or something. And it's like, do you want to promote yourself? And it's like so many artists, like that's such a thing. And so many artists, I know my friends who are just like, they will not promote themselves. And it's like, I have to force them to be like, please, please like bring me more into your world. You know, like, tell me, tell me more about what you're doing and it's like, why it's exciting to you and like, get me fired up about it. Because if you're not excited about it, like, why should I be excited about it? That's just how I feel. Perfect, perfect. I love what you just said, what Cadence Weapon just said about like, he's kind of giving people many different ways to like support him and be a fan of him. You know, like, obviously he's an artist and he's a musician and that's what he loves to do. But like, it's okay if he has someone who just wants to re read his newsletter too. Like, that's amazing, you know? And um, I think there's just a, a lesson there for everybody in that, like, if he had just stayed in his own head this whole time and been like, no, I'm an artist and that's what I'm going to focus on, he would have deprived so many people of, like, getting to know him and, and like, reading his amazing tweets and his amazing newsletter, which I'm a subscriber of. Thank, thank um, you, <laughs> But, yeah, I think that's just super cool and like even for myself like it was I was really hitting when you were saying all that because when I first like I first started in the, the music industry like I said more sort of like behind the scenes and then when I really started playing around with like DJing and, and making music myself I was in my head a lot about like well what am I going to focus on like what's going to be my thing and um, for a while it was like perfection paralysis a bit like I put it off for so long because I was just overthinking it and then eventually I was like well, I'm just going to try it all. Like I'm going to play hip hop and I'm going to play like R&B and I'm also going to play grime and maybe I'll only do that once in a while, but I can still do it and have fun with it. So, um, yeah. I just want to, I just want to point out just, um, that, um, I started doing a Twitch because of Josephine's Twitch. I was very inspired by her moves all during the pandemic. And I was just like, wow, I should really see if I could do that in my own way or something, you know? And I, I feel like it's, I'm really amazed just right now, just from like, I've been doing all this press for my album and so many of the interviewers are, are referencing things that I did that weren't like necessarily specifically like for the press, like, like people are referencing my newsletter and like, they're really, it's like, I, I realize that I'm, I'm creating my own like narrative around the album and I don't have to rely on PR in the same way that you traditionally would. And it's like, I never, I never really thought about that before. It's like, you have so much more control over how your music is, is perceived than you realize, you know? And I'm, 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 I've been at this for like a couple, um, almost two decades and I'm only realizing that now. <laughs> so, you know, think about that. Started when he was six. Okay. <laughs> Can you put that like letter in the chat? So, so people. Yeah, people absolutely. It. absolutely. It's in the so be, um, this again, sort of back to my, initial comment which is like one of the reasons like i'm loving this conversation and why i really was excited to have this conversation with the kids because i feel like we can really just break this down like we are you're a kid at rpsm right now um and whether it's you got a collections of songs or a collection of poems or really maybe you just got a collection of interests and you want to just kind of start to put that out where 
not so much where do you start, but what are some of the things um, you want to sort of consider or not consider? Is it just, you know, is it just a matter of, do we just launch? Um, I know I read somewhere, you know, someone had a saying of, you know, if you're not, if you're not embarrassed by the first thing you put out, you, you put it out too late. Um, some to that effect. So sort of just like sometimes not back to what Josephine said, not getting in your head too much about like what you want to put out is that you kind of need to go through some of these steps to get there. Uh, but if right now, you know, I, I've um, written and, and, you know, our students are pretty awesome. So uh, the they're, they're writing songs better than I did at that time. But if I want to put that out or if I want to start to build my brain, how do I start to think about um, building a fan base, going after a fan base and, and uh, getting something, getting that support behind me? Uh, I, I personally feel like it's... Um it's never too early to put out your music, you know, like I feel like all my earliest records are, you know, some of the first stuff I made and, you know, that really got me built a lot of momentum just on people being like, wow, this is new and interesting. Like I want to check this out or whatever, you know? Um, I feel like now, nowadays, like the way music is and like with, with like TikTok and all these different ways of doing it, I don't know. It's hard to say. I've, I've kind of lost track of what I was saying. Melissa, I feel like you had something you were going to say. <laughs> I'll just say that I don't do Twitch. And not that I wouldn't do Twitch, but every time there's like a new thing, like I took forever to join TikTok, I got on and I got off. You know, mm. how do I embrace these new things that I just kind of think are gimmicky, but then clearly they have, um, uh, they've, they've got likes, they, they pick up steam. Like, uh, anyways, I'll, I'll let you include that in, in what you tell us, Melissa. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to kind of uh, reference something that Hayden said before that I think is really, really important is that I think we are living in like an unprecedented time when if you are an artist, if you make something beautiful, you do not need the press person, you do not need someone else to tell your story for you. You have an odd, you have a platform that can reach the entire world that you can really form and create that narrative. Um, and make sure that is something that you're comfortable with, something that talks about you accurately before anybody else starts telling your story on your behalf. And I think, you know, now that we've been living with social media for about 15, 20 years now, um, on top of all of the benefits and all of the really great things it can give us, I think that it's also given us a lot of information about not every single social media platform needs to be for every single person. I think that you can be really selective and you can be really decisive about what makes the most sense for you in terms of what it is that you want to say and what you're trying to accomplish. So I think if the writing kind of editorial sort of media stream um, or something that's a hybrid of that, or, or if you are uh, somebody who tells really good stories using your voice, using your text, Twitter might be a great option because it's so text focused and it encourages people to be short and concise and think of big thoughts and put it together in a way that's really simple and clear versus if, if you are somebody who is a visual storyteller or an audio visual storyteller, or you just have great jokes, or you just like have weird observations that your friends always love or that like crack up your class, like TikTok might be a really good option. And I think um, watching the way that a lot of artists have used TikTok in a number of different ways um, to me as like an extension of their music. So it's like you have the song, the song says one thing, but you can in a lot of ways continue that story with your Twitter account, with your TikTok account, with Instagram, if there are really great visuals that you just want to add to amplify things. Um, you kind of have like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor, but it's like you're making a meal and I'm sorry, like Josephine, I don't cook. Yet I'm always drawn to making cooking metaphors. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know what comes first, like the onion or the garlic or the spoon or the heat. I don't know. Um, but it's like you, 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 you have a number of ingredients in front of you and like you kind of have an idea of what, what it is you want to build at the end. So it's just a matter of like putting together the right ingredients that make sense. And one thing that I really want to emphasize is that when it comes to promotion when it comes to self-promotion especially on social media like I think your focus should always be checking in on yourself checking in on how mentally and emotionally you're responding to the things that you see because it's great to be in front of everyone and it's great to be really active and really present and I think um, that's something you can kind of build into 
a larger strategy, but you also want to make sure you're taking care of yourself. So if ever using these platforms feels like it's not making you feel good, like it's giving you this weird feeling of knots in your stomach, um, you know, your people will like, you will not be forgotten. People will follow you. People will pay attention to you. Um, if you need to take a little break and come back. And I think it's really, we're at a really exciting time um, when, you know, we don't really need to be beholden to how we use these platforms. We can kind of make sure that they work for us in an effective and healthy way. Yeah, I really want to key in on that. Um, it's really important with social media. You, you it, it's, it's important as an artist, use social media, don't let it use you. You know, and it's like, I, I honestly, this has happened to me many times in my career where it's like, I get so caught up in, you know, oh, it's like, I got to like get more followers or something. Or it's like, oh no, it's like, they didn't like this tweet today or whatever. And like, I'm like feeling really bad about it. And it's like, it's like, you can step away from the computer and in everything there's a real world out there and, and it's fine. So, you know, use it. Don't, I have to tell my artist friends this all the time too because like you know it's easy to get really sad about the internet you know and I have I remind them I'm like you're using the internet the internet isn't using you like I always think of that Tyler the creator thing where he's like it's, I think it was a tweet where he's just like oh why don't just shut the shut the computer down you know if you're feeling bad shut it shut it off that's all I'm saying sometimes it's hard to do that so Josephine I didn't come back to you which is now you know, not everybody wants to be in front of the camera. Um, yeah. One of the things which is uh, also that we, we were talking about, but um, haven't explicitly said, which is kind of like fans of the culture. So fans of like the music, of the art, of the fashion and whatnot. If, you know, if you're looking at it uh, as, a, as a student in RPSM, I'm always just trying to bring it back to the kids and you're saying, hey, you know, I don't think I, I need to kind of put my face out there, but I'd love to help my friend because I think she's super talented. I'd love to help her get her her stuff out there. I'd love to help her find some brands that would align with what she's doing, um, you know, and, and start that journey. And not only that, I kind of like love being around this. So I'd love to interact with different brands doing things like that. Where do you uh, not just start, but what do you start? What are you doing along that path to eventually kind of get recognized on both sides, both by artists or, you know, um, uh, I don't want to say influencers, but, but content, you know, creators, if you will, I don't like that word either, but, um, and vice versa <laughs> on the other side, um, you know, how do, how do you, how do you start to fit into that place and how do you get to, um, well, how do you get to be where, where you and Melissa are? Like, yeah, I love that question because, um, we like need those people so much, you know, this is Frieza right here. It's my partner. He just popped in here. <laughs> um, we need those people so much like you know it shouldn't always fall on the artist or the creator to to constantly be the one like shouting about how great they are you know what i mean and i think that is actually one of the like things that's really um really tricky about like the current music landscape is that it does often fall on people who maybe don't really want to always do that or they want to focus a little bit more on their art so um i think that yeah it could be honestly as easy as just sharing the things that you're into on your social platforms like it's actually amazing how many people you know when I share store uh songs from Spotify to my Instagram story by my friends or maybe by big artists it's amazing how many people will write back and be like oh cool I, I never heard this before like thanks for showing me this or whatever you know so um just if you're someone who who doesn't necessarily want to be the star of the show but you want to be involved just a simple share is a great way to do it. And um, thinking about your, the skills that you have and how you can use that to platform others is really like the reason why Frieza, who's the guy who just popped in here, and I started our label, Bear Selection. Um, the whole purpose of that was that we, we kind of realized we both, you know, had these skill sets that were like very complementary of each other. And we were, we were kind of doing it already anyways. But we're like, let's just like organize this under an official thing and really get serious about, um, you know, helping artists release music that we want to see more of. Um, and it's, it's a passion project, you know, like it, it's, it doesn't really earn a lot of money or anything like that, but we both love it. And, and um, 
you know, my skill set is obviously more in like in the branding and marketing and, and PR end of things. And I do all of that stuff for all the artists on our label. And then Frieza's end, he does a lot more of like, he, he does mixing and mastering and he's the one who's kind of like curating all the releases and, and together we're able to come together and do something dope for other artists who, you know, they, they, they can definitely release on their own. Like anybody can do that nowadays. Um, but they might not like doing the whole like pitching out to press and sending all the stuff out to radio DJs and and that's where we kind of come in and are able to help support them that way. Um, and it's so fulfilling, you know, it's it's really fun to to work with younger artists like we worked with this producer named more Knight, who we worked with him like two years ago and he wasn't super known back then and um, you know we got him like his his first like big story and like a pretty big music blog and we got his DJs on BBC playing his music and he was so excited about that and um you know now he's doing big things and working with big artists but it's cool to be part of someone's story um that way and it's fulfilling for me in a completely different way than with my own artistic pursuits so um I would very much encourage anybody out there who's just you know a music fan and wants to get involved like a simple share goes a long way and I can see Akeem said the little things add up it's so true like I get so like excited when someone shares something that I've done I'm like oh my gosh thanks <laughs> it's really motivating so um that support means everything and and another thing too is that like you know with with all these platforms and like TikTok especially like you can go viral you can go really far you can reach a lot of people all over the world but it's so important to have that actual core base around you of like your real life people, you know what I mean? And that's that's the first place to start whenever you do something is just share it with like your friends and family and, um, you know, build up that support around you in, in the immediate of people you know in, in real life. Like internet friends are awesome, don't get me wrong, but like we definitely need those like IRL connections to keep us super grounded. Perfect. Yeah, I, I feel like that is such such an important point. Um, and, you know, to answer sort of Thompson, your question about uh, like what to do if like you kind of know that you want to be out there, but it like feels a little strange for you. I remember somebody once told me that to sort of develop like a, a group of people cheering for you, you kind of need to be a cheerleader for a bunch of people and that energy will sort of be returned and that will kind of be cyclical. And I think in some ways as well, like that can also help you sort of like amplify your own content and your own profile. Um, if you feel like you have something that like still needs a little bit more work, you're not quite ready to share your stuff, there's nothing stopping you from sharing the work of your friends or the work of your people around you. And that kind of helps everybody because on your end, it makes it clear what your interests are, it makes it clear what it is that you stand for, um, who your community is. And then obviously it like helps out the community around you because you're giving them access to a couple of more eyeballs. Um, uh, Cadence might know this because this is like pretty popular in like the newsletter world, but I think it was somebody at Slate Magazine who was talking about um, this idea where you don't necessarily need to have a million fans, you don't need to go viral, you only need, you know what I'm going to say? A thousand fans. <laughs> a thousand true fans. You need a thousand true fans. That is the realest thing <laughs> ever. I, that the, everybody write that down. You just need a thousand true fans thousand and you can have a career in music. And that can be like every friend that you've ever made that you've held really tightly. And if they are, if they want to ride for you and if they're devoted for you, they will kind of follow you to the ends of the earth. And a thousand true fans will take you really far. And I think that a lot of times those things are right in our backyard. They're in our communities. They're in the groups that we're already a part of. We don't actually need to go really far to find that. So when you start to think about it in that respect where it's like you're not always shouting to the entire world sometimes you're shouting to people who already love you who already want to support you and they only want to see you shine and they only want to see you grow so hopefully in a way that kind of helps like lessen some of the anxiety and some of the stress that can go into feeling like you need to perform for a bunch of strangers i think yeah it, it, i love everything that i'm hearing right now because it's like it, it truly takes a village 
you know, mm-hmm. that that saying is really real. I feel like when I first started out, I was sending tracks to my friends and that was helping me refine my sound. I used to like, especially I, I lived in Montreal briefly and in that community, there was so much sharing and so much uh, constructive criticism. And, you know, it, we, it was all like our own incubation center, you know, it was like, you know, it, it was it was just such a great experience to bounce ideas off of each other and really not only with our friends but the like people in the community would really get up around the local bands and stuff and it really built this kind of I saw it happen with like a couple artists with like Grimes and Mac DeMarco you know these were people who were living down the street from me in the same apartment building as me and it was just like you get reach this critical mass of community appreciation where it, you know it, you can go to the moon I mean, literally, something in Grimes's case. Awesome. We're we're gonna open it up to questions, but before we do, we like to do uh, a segment which is called taking the learning forward. And so, really, we just kind of ask if you know, for th- talking about self promotion, what are like one or two either resources um, or ideas or places you could direct uh, the students to just say, you know, here's a place to start and just. Just dive into that, you know, don't worry about all the information that's there, you know, dive into this first and see what you can do with that. I'll, uh, Josephine, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I kind of already um, spoke about one of the things that I would say is a good exercise to do. And it's something that I do when I work, you know, with artists on their marketing um, is that whole idea about these like sort of buckets of interests. you know, it's a good, it's a great brainstorming exercise to do with yourself and, and to redo it with yourself, you know, every now and then, like, I, I kind of do these check-ins with myself every year or something, just so I can be like, am I still into the same things I was a year ago? Do I still want to be like going the same places when you're, you know, an artist or an entrepreneur, you're like really driving the ship of how you want people to perceive you. So it's important that you have this clear vision, you know, Um, so I would recommend doing that and just trying to come up with like, like I call them like buckets or like pillars. I don't know. It's like the more like corporate speak, but like you can call them anything. You can have like three or four of them and just, and just sort of have those, those four things that you're really trying to make sure that everything you do fits underneath those. Um, and then you should have like a really, a nice tight brand. Yes. Buckets, the book coming 2026. Um, And what else? Like, I mean, I used to be quite an avid reader. I know Cadence Weapon's a very avid reader and um, I've kind of fallen off of it like in the last little while, but I'm I'm getting back on, I promise. Um, And I'm currently reading a book that I honestly wish I had, I'd read this years ago. So I'm gonna pass this on. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, I'm a a Kobo person, so I have an ebook, but it's all about, just building good habits and breaking bad ones. And I think that this is so, um, it, you can literally take what he's talking about here and apply it to anything, whether it's like self-promotion, whether it's like exercising, eating healthily, all kinds of stuff. So um, I'm, I'm halfway through this and I'm, I'm loving it and I'm wishing I had found this in university. <laughs> so um, yeah, Atomic Habits, I'll, I can put it in the, uh, oh wait. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out. Did. Thank you so much. James Clear also has a, um, he has a weekly or bi-weekly um, e-letter. So if you if you sign up to his mailing list, he sends you these things, get them on LinkedIn, whatever, uh, always sending articles that he does. He, has, he puts out quite a bit of content. Um, I actually picked up that book uh, for free somehow on, um, my audible so it showed up as like a it's yeah it's a great book with suggested it's a great book um, yeah and 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 one thing about this book that i like is that like i've come to realize over the years that being creative is much more about like discipline than it is like a stroke of creative genius you know like it's as long as you are like creating that routine for yourself, being disciplined in your practice, like that's where the the genius comes from. It doesn't just like strike you one day when you're like playing Call of Duty or whatever. I don't know, it might, but uh, but you really got to train your brain to think that way. So that's what I love about this book in terms of creativity. Yeah, I like that. You know, I say to people a lot: if you think about your favorite artists. Um, doesn't matter if it's Mozart to Jay-Z to Stevie Wonder. I don't think it's not a coincidence that your favorite artists also have the biggest breadth of work, right? So in order to get to that good stuff, you just have to create a, a volume of things. Um, Melissa, what's uh, what's your takeaway or your giveaway, I should say? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I am a pretty big podcast person. Um, and I think, you know, maybe part of it is sort of in the pandemic, I miss hearing voices. I miss hearing like people talking to me and, um, and, and listening and listening to people talk and feeling like I'm a student of what, uh, what people are saying and what they're interested in. So uh, I can kind of put together a playlist afterwards, but I think that there are a lot of really great um, artist focused podcasts that I think work to just give you a better and a fuller idea of what the music industry or what the writing world or what the um, what any kind of creative space that you're fascinated with looks like and might mean for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I think this might be like a little offside, but I do think it was a really illuminating listen for me to actually um, spend some time with the Radio Lab podcast on Dolly Parton. And I think that she is like the kind of artist that we really don't consider, um, but it kind of takes you through her life. And I think in a lot of ways, it tells us a lot of positive and also a lot of like harrowing stories about the music industry. And I feel like when you're in an early stage, one of the best things you can do, something that I always um, kind of am glad that I had this type of foresight when I was younger was to just spend a lot of time educating myself and spend a lot of time like teaching myself about the artists that I liked and why I liked them and what they were doing in a positive and productive way because when you get a little older that time becomes finite and it becomes a lot more difficult to become a student of somebody that you think is making really interesting work so you know that was sort of just one example of seeing how somebody like Dolly kind of like moves between uh, spaces of country music, but also she wrote um, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And she also like had a lot of, you know, was the reason why a lot of Americans have vaccines right now. And she is somebody who has found a way to kind of think about herself and think about her art and think about her activism that feels really involved. So that would kind of be my suggestion. And, you know, on top of that, just when it comes to the self-promotion side in particular, you know, Cadence is a fantastic example of somebody who does a number of things and does them all remarkably well. And I think you, you, you know, those are the artists you kind of need to look to in terms of examples and in terms of role models of the many different ways you can flex and kind of utilize your voice because you can be a great singer, you can be a great lyricist but you're also probably a great writer as well and sometimes it just means um seeing somebody else in a position that's doing that to kind of give you the inspiration or the insight to kind of follow that as well so uh yeah anybody that you're kind of a fan of like look at the way they're running their socials look at the way that they're running their instagram and their twitter and their tiktok and see if there are things that you like and see if there are takeaways there and um the last piece is just sort of on top of that, like also reading just just music writing about artists that you're a fan of, because I think, you know, in a lot of ways, social media gives us the opportunity to have artists tell their own story. But I also think that the role of the writer and the role of music editorial is to kind of contextualize that in culture in a way that um, really attaches some of the dots. So I'm thinking of, you know, a lot of really fantastic writing by artists here in Toronto, like Kelsey Adams and Sarah Hagee about Mustafa. I'm thinking about, um, you know, how people from this city have told stories about people from this city that is filled with so much love and so much thought and so much compassion. And I think, you know, that to me is a really great act of standard setting. Um, when you think about how you want your story told in the future. That's awesome. And Mustafa actually, who has a relationship with the school as well. So um, some of the students will be familiar. All right. We know you got a book coming out, so we'll have to wait before we can read that and all the tips and stuff like that. Um, but coming back to you as well, like what is that? What is not, and it's not so much what's the one takeaway that you have to do this or whatnot. I think these are more guidelines as, you know, people are doing things in very different ways and to achieve the same goals. What would be um, what do you, one of your suggestions or something that you could sort of impart? Well, I, I'm, what I want to say is really kind of a jump off of what Melissa was saying. I, I think she had some really interesting points. 
Um, I think as an artist, I think the thing that has helped me the most is, you know, I'm going to quote Drake here, know yourself, truly know yourself, because I feel like the, the closer I've gotten to knowing the essence of who I want to be as an, as an artist, the better, the easier it's been for me to express it to other people, right? So is, you know, that, that's the thing It's like, okay, I want to make drill music. Okay. I listen to every UK drill record that comes out. I listen to every New York drill record. I become an expert in this music. That's the thing I do every time. It's like, if I'm into something, I find out about everything. If you want to make this kind of music, be obsessive. You know, that's something I, I, I always say is like, really dig into it. You know, it's like anybody who has made it in, in art, they, they are a student of the game, you know? And that's something that I really want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, especially what you, what Melissa was saying about um, looking at other people's social media, you know, it's like, I love, you know, when, okay, here's, I'll tell you about the process. It's like, okay, maybe I hear about an artist uh, from a Spotify playlist and I'm like, oh, who is this? I really like this song. And then I check out their Instagram. I'm like, oh, I really like how they're moving on their Instagram. This is really interesting. I'm going to follow them. And it becomes this whole thing where I'm like, okay, it's like, you can learn from other artists. So you don't want to just be like sequestered in your own, like, oh, I'm just going to do my own thing. And it's like, you know, music is a conversation. And I think even the aesthetic stuff is also a conversation. And you want to be a part of, the, of today's conversation as well. So the more that you know about what's going on today, the better it is for you as an artist. Um, but the one thing I want to talk about is I have um, a book recommendation. It's called The Death of the Artist. This book blew my mind. Because at first, I was really um, scared to read it because I'm an artist and I was like, oh, this sounds bad for me, but it's actually really was encouraging because it's all about the history of artists all the way far back into history. Like I actually wrote an essay about this book in my uh, newsletter, you should check it out. Um, but it's amazing how they talk about being an artist in the 21st century and how, you know, how you make money as an artist. That's the biggest thing is like, people are afraid to talk about it, but this, 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 uh, the author, William uh, Derezowicz, he um, interviews so many different artists. He interviewed Chance the Rapper, artists of all disciplines and asked them all the hard questions about the money and how do you actually do this stuff? And it's so illuminating. And it was so encouraging to see that almost every artist is struggling in the exact same way as me. And uh, they're all just trying to, you know, reach this certain level of artistry. And I think the number one takeaway I had from this book that you should really think about even as just starting out as an artist or be wanting to be in music or whatever, is that the, the goal of being an artist, it isn't about like, oh, I'm gonna like make a million bucks or whatever. It's about being able to be an artist for as long as possible, to live and make a living as an artist. That, that's the goal, right? And that, that's something that blew my mind, the way that he articulates it, is it's like, you know, you could be, um, I'll, I'll, it's happened to me, so I'll explain it this way. It was like, at first I was a new artist, right? And it was like, oh, I'm like treading water, trying to stay in the game, right? Then suddenly after a few years, I look up and now uh, people look to me as an established artist. And then I'm just like, okay, wow, I'm still able to make art after 10 years. You know, that in itself is a victory. You know, so I think thinking in terms of, yo, I want to do this for the rest of my life, that, that's a huge win. You know, if you can make a living in music, that's that's the win. So check out this book, The Death of the Artist. Uh, it's really good. I was going to say that, you know, um, I appreciate you taking a Socrates quote and uh, attributing it to Drake, but uh, <laughs> you did redeem yourself with The Death of the Artist. Um, the, uh, I know, I think that's great. I loved actually what you said, because one of the things I've thought um, at, a, at a lot of levels, definitely at the post-secondary level, when it, when it comes to art, um, I studied you know, music, which was that we don't know how artists make money. And if you knew how artists made money, that you know, maybe that job you thought you weren't going to do because you didn't want to be a starving artist, but would I'll actually allow you to prolong the amount of time you get to make your art wouldn't look would look very differently, right? Um, and I think really getting in tune with everyone is kind of the way artists make money is in many different streams. And so as you start to understand that, it kind of opens up 
what is possible and what you kind of have your hangups about. Um, you know, I, I, I put it as it took me a while to get over what I thought an artist needed to be before I could kind of allow myself to dabble in a few different things so that I could do more art. So anyways, I appreciate that. Um, I just want to say one little more thing. You know, no. go ahead, interrupt me. Sorry. <laughs> but it's like um, being a musician is, and I'm sure you know this as well, it's like be, it's, it's an ebb and flow, right? And it's like, you have to realize, you know, sometimes you're going to be hot, sometimes you're going to be cold, and you have to learn to be okay with that. And that I think is the biggest challenge for a lot of artists that I've known, you know, is like when they're not popping, they're like, they are ready to quit, or they, or they can't like emotionally take it. And it's like, you have to think like a pitcher in baseball or something. It's like, if you, if somebody got a home run off of you, you got to have a short memory. As an artist, you got to have a short memory. Trust me, because you're gonna you're gonna apply for grants. You're not gonna get them. You know, there's gonna be a lot of ups and downs. But it's all about staying steady. That's one thing I wanted to say. No, it's funny. I had a music teacher who said that uh, the artists he saw or the musicians he saw who did the best after were the ones who could manage their disappointment. So, um, you know, like you said, it's going to be good days, bad days, but uh, if you can manage those disappointments because they're coming, uh, yeah. I'll give you, they'll give you a chance. Um, at this time, we want to open up the floor uh, for some questions from the representative from uh, the RPSM Youth Committee. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the Youth Committee, it is a community wide a community-wide youth group that for young leaders in high school uh, they meet virtually at this time each week thursdays from seven to eight uh, and engage in social activities discussions workshops like this one um, in leadership development uh, if you're looking for more information or interested in signing up uh, signing your child up feel free to email jasper at student development at rpmusic.org and uh, we'll put that as well into the chat so at this point in time i'm gonna call i don't know who we're spotlighting today for the first question to kick it off but um uh jerry yes jerry oh and you actually turned your camera on not everyone turns the camera i appreciate you doing that what's your question Hi, I'm Jerry, and my question is, in your opinion, is it possible to self-promote without spending any money and only using free resources, or are there things I should expect to pay for? I'll let That's anybody take that. Question. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, in my opinion, it is very possible to develop like a, an early following without paying any money without spend, but I mean, you know, I think if you want to get to a certain level or if you want to escalate the fan base, I think you, you should realize it's okay to spend a little money, you know, and, and, it, on, and as long as you're, you, you've done enough research before to be like, you know what you're spending your money on because you don't want to just start spending money just to spend money to be like, I'm, I'm investing in my career. It's like very important to be really mindful about what the right thing is, you know, and it, that's different for everyone. For some people, if you have a certain level of a fan base, it's good to spend money on PR. I, I, I honestly recommend that. I go to sleep and, and pray and thank the Lord that I got to know my publicists because they've helped me a lot. Um, but that might not be the right thing for every artist. So I think it's just important about figuring that out for yourself. You know, I wouldn't just like blow a bunch of money on like Facebook ads, like right away, you know, mm -hmm. like think about how you want to use it first, you know? Yeah, I think um, what is really interesting when we start having conversations about what you want to what you want to spend money on or what you want to allocate your funds to um, is also one that you can be kind of, prescriptive about because something that social media um, actually makes available uh, it's just pretty like basic sort of data about how things are working and you can actually sort of develop some insights on you know if you post something on Instagram there are different platforms you can use that tell you how people are responding to things how people are liking things um, you know and who those I, people are too right exactly and so you like yeah. Yeah. And like give you a lot of details on that. So to me, I think that the moment when it's like, oh, I, I feel like I've done everything that I can do. I'm looking at the data. I'm using all of my free resources. I've talked to all of my communities and you're like, I really just need that extra push. Um, I think that's kind of where your creative community comes in, where you say, you know, I'm, I'm 
brushing up against some of these barriers, where do you think would be a good place to devote my money? And they can kind of help you sidestep some um, pit, some like poor decisions they might have made in the past. But in terms of the actual like self promotion and kind of like even just creating stuff for social media, I am a big advocate for a lot of great free resources. I think Canva can be your friend. I think that there are places like InShot where you can make like a really beautiful like TikTok video without needing to go through a bunch of fancy video production sort of software stuff. And, um, you know, like you can make things look really professional and really legit for zero dollars for a really long time um, until you actually need to open up your pocket. So yes, to answer your question, no, I don't think you need to spend a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about uh, a few days ago, Canva. Uh, yeah. Lucas put up Canva to, I just discovered it. I'm using it for us, some other things, not myself personally yet, but uh, it's a great way to just, you know, um, curate a look, you know, uh, for free. You just, you know, create a look and already it'll look like somebody, like you paid somebody to do that for you. So uh, do we have any other questions from the, from our students um, for any of our panelists? Oh, actually, I did want to actually say something um, just piggybacking on what you had said before, Kane, uh, around artists and what they're making money around this promotion, exactly what you guys are talking about is also understanding what are people paying money for? Because I think sometimes, you know, um, it, it uh, highlights the point that it may seem that some of this stuff is organic, but some people have actually paid a lot of money to make things look organic. And so <laughs> it's great to understand the landscape of that and what, um, where people are putting behind, putting money behind things that they're getting out to uh, the public and where they're focusing. A lot of it too, is just doing the math too. And you got to realize, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense to spend all this money to get a bunch of Spotify streams because the money doesn't come back the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like really being, being really cautious about decisions. Like for instance, um, on this album cycle, um, the first video I had for the song Cinna, um, we did a Wavo social media campaign and that was, you know, it cost a thousand dollars to do that. But it, it made sense because the song already had some momentum and, you know, we, we I, I, the video, we had gotten a grant to make the video and like we, we had a good feeling about it. And it really resulted in a lot more views for the video, a lot of more attention for the record. I sold some records and it ends up like balancing out in the end and it gets people, people to like know about your album. Right. So it's like in that situation that made sense for me to do that at that time, but it's not. And it's also a targeted marketing style too. It wasn't just mar targeting every person who's on the internet. It was like people who like, you know, kind of eclectic rap music and are from the ages of 20 to 35 or something, you know, like it was like very, very specific. Um, and I think that's a really good way to use your money is when, when you, when you know, it's like, it's like, okay, it's like fans of uh, death grips and, um, um, run the jewels. I'm like, yeah, I want to be around them. That makes sense. You know, we had a question, um, from Sophia. It was earlier in the chat. She just wanted to know, uh, are there any lessons you learned in school, um, that apply to grade 11 students who are looking to pursue arts in, uh, art related universities? I don't know if the, um, was it, how stressful was it? Like your thoughts path, like any, any suggestions? I did go to university, but I went back to school like much later after I had finished high school. So I, my path there was like a little bit more, I don't know, it was different. I didn't go through the like application process while in high school. So I don't know if I can really speak to that specific question. Yeah, um, I, I can't either. So um, Melissa? Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think what's really, what I remember from grade 11 and also grade 12 is just like, I think grade 11, more so than any other year in my entire life, feeling like an incredible amount of pressure to know exactly what I needed to do or to, to feel like I needed to know exactly what I wanted to do with my life at that age, at that moment, when I was like going through the portals and picking what programs at which universities I wanted to go to. 
And what I can say about that is that I think that sometimes it seems like you need to have a full plan in place and that those applications are really rigorous. And I think that, you know, if you're kind of leaning towards one thing and it sort of feels like a fit, there's nothing wrong with going down that path because when you're in university or college or any kind of post-secondary institution, there are lots and lots of opportunities to change course and to change direction. And I started out doing a major in like biology and then I switched to linguistics and then I <laughs> switched to English and then I landed <laughs> and then I landed in city planning and book and media studies and like did all of that um, in a way that like felt like it made sense at the time and taught me a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we're never really running, you know, you're never really racing against the clock. There's always time, as Josephine said, to go back to school, to do more learning, to spend a little bit more time, to take classes in the summer if that's available to you. And I think, I think that if I remember correctly, that question specifically mentioned art school and from, you know, I, I went to U of T, so U of T is pretty far from an art school, but I feel like just art communities kind of are always sort of the same. And um, I feel like a little bit of a broken telephone, but I think my best advice can be like, find a couple of people that you love and a couple of people that share your vision and a couple of people that you trust. And in a lot of ways, those will be the same people that you lean on at later points in your career once you've established that relationship in university. And I think that can kind of help like weed out potentially some of the stress um, and maybe like some of the toxic cultures of competition that you can find in places where you have a lot of smart creative people um, all in the same place at once. Awesome. Uh, I believe I saw in the chat, um, Tamoya, uh, did you have a question? Are you going to write it in the chat? You're going to jump on and speak to us. Hi, I have a question. Yes, I do. Um, my first question is for Candice. And I wanted to ask, um, what was it that gave you the motivation to want to self-promote? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing is like when I was first doing it, I didn't even think it was a thing, you know, like, uh, I never thought of like, Oh, I have to promote myself. Like it was just like what I was doing, you know, and it, I just had the natural inclination to do it, you know, where it was just like, um, I, you know, I was just like back, back then, like I was just uh, making my own CDs and like burning CDs and like going to the bar and selling them out of my backpack. And like, I still have that same exact mentality today. You know, and it's like, I just really like sharing things, you know, I, I think, you know, I worked at a record store, I worked at HMV, and I was just like, I, I for a while in Edmonton, I was more well known for giving album recommendations than I was for making music. You know, like people were like, Oh, man, you totally show me this underground rap record, like, and I, like years later, I'm like, Okay, cool. But, you know, I guess, what really made me do it, I, I think it was just, it just came naturally. You know, and it's like, I, I never did it in a way that was like, I was spamming too. That was another thing is like, I really, it comes from a place of excitement. You know, that's the thing is like, I'm just really excited about what I want to share with people always, you know? And, and I think people can feel that through the screen and they can feel that through the way that you present it. It's like what I'm showing you, I'm like really interested in it, like genuinely. And I want to have a discussion about it. And I want to like build on it, you know? And it's like, I think if you can kind of, present it in a way where the passion comes before like oh I want you to see this I want you to like amplify me or whatever I think people will feel it too you know I, I hope that helps <laughs> awesome yeah. uh, we're gonna take oh sorry tomorrow did I, I I interrupted you I'm just looking at the time making sure that uh, we get one more in there from Eddie uh, if that's okay did you have another question or I do I have one more for, okay let's do that, let's do that. No, no, ask the, ask the question. We'll make, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Okay. I wanted to know, because you do your check-ins with yourself and you have your three to four bucket topics, mm -hmm. um, how often do you change, I guess, like your focus points since you have so many interests and you want people to constantly know that you're interested in more than just a couple of things? Yeah, I think that would kind of be different for for everybody, you know, and it would kind of depend on like where you're at in your journey. 
and um, you know, have you achieved what you want to achieve in regards to X thing? Um, that's why I think it's good to do all the time, you know, as you move through your career as an artist or a creative and, and you're gonna, you start to have different experiences. And, and honestly, for me, like I'm doing so many things now that I never thought I would be doing, like, you know, even three years ago. And like, as a result of this pandemic, my life has changed so much and how it looks. And now I have other interests and other things I want to pursue. Even one year ago, I didn't know were possible. Um, so I think that's what's fun about always like remaining a student and remaining curious is that like it's going to change and um, change is good. You know, you should embrace that. And I just want to add something to that just real quick is it's like the thing about an artistic lifestyle or like art admin jobs, the most exciting thing about them is, is never the same thing every day. You always are doing something new, something different. You won't know what you're going to be doing the next week, but it, it, there's an excitement in that. So you made me think of that. Awesome. And uh, Eddie, we'll, we'll end off with you for the questions. If you'd like to ask a question. Oh, yeah, you guys, I actually got accepted to uh, R6, I think. Pardon, say that again? I actually got accepted. Oh, you got accepted. You guys should check out how the, right, Jasper? Awesome. I'm looking for the mute button here. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie got accepted to an art show. Um, we can put some details about that. And we can share about about that in a bit. But he got congratulations, Eddie. He's a nice. visual artist. He does his own paintings. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Amazing. Hey, great. Eddie. Awesome. Awesome. Go off, King. Uh, so awesome. Awesome. This has been. Uh, thanks so much. Big thank you to the panelists, Melissa. Uh, Cadence. Now I want to say Candace. Yeah, I bet you get that a lot, right? People see the name and want to do that. Josephine, I appreciate it. We love the insights. This has probably been uh, probably been one of the most energetic. Uh, so I just feel like I'm trying to get more information. There's even stuff we didn't get to uh, touch on. So hopefully we'll have we'll get a chance to have you on again at some point um, in time. Uh, once again, uh, Cadence Weapon Parallel World dropping April 30th on all streams. So make sure you cop that. Remember what I said: Spotify, Apple Music, you know, Amazon. And then next week, go buy it um, for uh, Bandcamp Fridays. Uh, yeah. off there. <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks, special thanks to Lucas, Simone, and Charlotte um, and the Youth Committee for supporting this event, like always. Uh, thanks to Stephanie Perficati and Jasper Gahunia uh, for bringing the series to life uh, behind the scenes. Shout out to Regent Park Catering uh, Collective and Devin Good Food for the discount food deal they provide for our online events. Uh, please check back with your YouTube channel as well. Um, as the Every Little Voice podcast for the past um, RPSM talks recordings. Um, make sure you RSVP for the next one happening May 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, topic to be announced. I am Thompson Egbo Egbo, and this concludes our third installment. Um, and I think, our, like I said, our, our most energetic and awesome one, I think, for me, I've learned a ton. Um, and it's definitely things that I wish that I had kind of gotten out of my own head to be a part of uh, earlier on. And then we're going to leave you with a song selection coming off of Josephine's uh, label from Bear Selections. Um, this is Boss by Leja and featuring Logan Ohm. We'll talk to you soon. Every man want me the boss.